She heard footsteps mounting on the stair, mounting the stairs outside. The young man in the flat above had come home. Suppose, suppose she was Signor Collati. She was lying in the upper room of their villa in Italy, on the outskirts of Rome. Max had been appearing at the theater. He was coming home, dead tired. It was his footsteps she could hear dragging up the stairs. In another moment, the door would open. He would come in. He would get out of bed beside her. <clears throat> she would hold him. She would comfort him. She would send him to sleep. The footsteps passed, and a few moments later she heard the door of the flat above open and shut. She sighed and turned over in bed. Signora Collati. Signora Collodi. The next day, Bernard was due to leave for home. Julia got permission from Mr. Moffrey to have the morning off and took him to the station. She hardly noticed him. She kissed him goodbye mechanically, then sent a telegram to her sister to say that he was safely on the train. Then she had lunch, and for the first time in years, she did not have it at the ABC. She went to a small cafe opposite the old Palace Music Hall. There was just the chance as she sat there that she might see Max going in or coming out. The afternoon passed somehow. Even old Mr. Moffrey noticed Julia's abstraction, but he attributed it to the fact that she had been seeing off her ne that she had been seeing her nephew off. He himself was not feeling very well those days, so he gave Julia orders to close the office early, set his square hat firmly on his head, and went windily off to his old-fashioned house out Chiswick Way. Julia, for her part, locked up the office, hurried home, boiled herself an egg by way of supper, and then went out to the old palace music hall. There, in a, in a ferment of impatience, she sat through the acrobat set, the eccentric cyclist act, the ballad singing act. By the time the indicator showed her that Max Collodi was next on the on the bill, her heart was beating painfully, her hands had grown worn and clammy, her eyes were staring wide. Oh, I'm only of all sang the ridiculous George. Only of intriquist all, that's all. But Julie did not care what George was. It was Max, his master, she was interested in. She stared at the well-groomed, suave, poised figure, smiling so gently and pityingly at George's besets. She noted the small bow that he gave no... She noticed the small bow that he gave to acknowledge applause. The gentlemanly restraint of him so wonderfully unlike the exuberance of most music hall artistes. Max Collodi. Of course he was made up. It was possible that off stage he didn't look quite so young. Thirty-five, perhaps. Yes, thirty-five. The curtains swung together, the audience applauded. Julia sat still, entranced. They were applauding him, her Max. The curtains parted again. He was still sitting there, bowing a little and smiling, with the famous George grinning oafishly on her knee, on his knee. Max looked straight ahead. By sheer willpower, Julia tried to make him look in her direction. She had read of such things being possible, but perhaps her will was not strong enough. Max continued to look straight ahead at the audience in general. It was impossible to believe that anyone could be so handsome. A woman in front said so in a loud whisper to her neighbor, and the neighbor replied with a sneer, Yes, too handsome, if you ask me. Julia glared at her fiercely. She could have murdered her. She walked home slowly. On a bill on the, ho on the hoarding near her house, she saw his name in large lettering. Max Collodi, the gentleman ventriloquist with George. She looked hastily about her to see no one was near, then quickly tore away that corner of the bill. In her room, she straightened out the crumpled piece of paper and stared at it for a long time before tucking it away between the leaves of one of her favorite books. Now I must ask you to believe what may seem to you a normal human being the impossible, but remember the thirty-seven desolate years, the long empty hours in the terrible room with its peeling yellow wallpaper and its engravings of long-lost ships, remember the far-off seduction almost twenty years before, the broken engagement, the square soulless hat of Mr. Moffrey, 
Remember the solitary meals conjured from that single gas ring, the cold, unlovely love that had concentrated itself on the distant and unresponsive Bernard, and remember the story of the Eastern philosopher's glass eye, the other glass eye, the one that now rests on the black velvet on Julia's mantel shelf. That is all that remains these days of Julia's affair with Max Collodi, a glass eye, a curious, even a terrible relic. Every night for the rest of that first week, of her passion for Max Collodi, Julia paid her three shillings and sixpence to sit in the fatalists, as they were called.